Penis sizes are shrinking, which you might have seen from these headlines all over the internet. And in the last 40 years, sperm counts in men have decreased by 50%, and the distance between the anus and the genitals in boys, aka the taint, has been shrinking. So today, we are going to explain what is going on. What's up guys, Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. Today we are going to be talking about why penises are shrinking across the world. Yes, indeed. ASAP Science has almost 10 million subscribers and they published a video a few days ago called Why Penises Are Shrinking Across the World. And a bunch of you guys DM'd it to me because there is a lot of interplay with endocrine balance in this. They're talking about things that disrupt the HPTA, things that are going to downstream lead to hindered growth of your fucking Johnson, you know, shit that is important to you as a, if you're a teenager or somebody who is trying to optimize themselves, what do you need to know about the modern world and the risks you have relative to years ago? Like what, what is going on? What's the reason for the lack of like decrease in sperm, decrease in dick size, decrease in pretty much everything supposedly and how accurate really is it? So I'm going to sort of be adding in my own two cents as we go here because there are some bold claims made in the video and they're basically just saying, uh, well, I'll just let him fucking talk and then I'll, <laughs> I'll interject as we go. Penis sizes are shrinking, which you might've seen from these headlines all over the internet. And in the last 40 years, sperm counts in men have decreased by 50% and the distance between the anus and the genitals in boys, AKA the taint has been shrinking. So today we are going to explain what is going on. Testosterone levels in men have been declining since 1982. A meta-analysis of over 185 studies that looked at over 48,000 men found that between the years of 1973 and 2011, male sperm concentration had decreased by 52% and overall sperm count had decreased by 59%. So, you know, one thing that I've been noticing too, and I think is uh, um, one of the most obvious signs of, you know, decreasing testosterone is reference ranges getting lower and lower. When you look at LabCorp ranges, when you look at Quest Labs ranges, when you look at different labs, especially in like Canada and shit, some of these reference ranges go very low now, dude. Like low, like hypogonadal is now like 200 and your elite genetic phenom is like 850 to 900 in some of these places. Like it's fucking insane. So, you know, back in the day or in, you know, more generous reference range territory, you'd have something like a 1200 would be like a genetic phenom. Now you have guys who are like, scraping high normal with what supposedly is like top 0.0001% genetics at this point, or at least testosterone production, because that doesn't necessarily dictate your genetics are good for athletics or anything like that. It just means you have high testosterone, which anyways, it's a whole different video. <laughs> but um, yeah, the metrics are definitely showing that there is, you know, something going on in general. Now, of course, the population in general is more unhealthy than ever as a result of lifestyle choices, sleep hygiene practices, etc. People are working longer hours. People are abusing the fucking of drugs more and more, cranking their cortisol through the fucking roof, getting shitty amounts of sleep, having these cyclical, horrible lifestyle patterns, neglecting their body composition entirely, getting fat as hell, which has negative feedback to the HBTA. Shit like this, like there is what is it, like the highest level of obesity there's ever been? Like, what do you think that's gonna have an effect on when it comes to testosterone production? It's going to lower your testosterone levels. So, you know, I'm not surprised. And I think some of the shit in this video is a bit of a stretch to claim like this is the whole reason when it doesn't look at like very basic obvious things that have to do with the actual negative feedback to the HPTA. Rather, this video sort of elaborates on like how plastics are gonna like bind to estrogen receptors and like activate them and shit to then cause the negative feedback that you would otherwise actually get from being a fat ass. 26% of men who have erectile dysfunction are now under the age of 40. Looking at sperm bank semen in 1963, one teaspoon of sperm, which is your average ejaculation, would have had 99 million viable sperm per milliliter. By 2011, it had fallen all the way to only 49 million viable sperm. And the decrease in the sperm count, sperm concentration, and viable sperm is why now male fertility issues contribute one quarter to one third of all fertility issues. And now we are starting to understand finally why this is happening. It comes down to plastics, pesticides, and the chemicals in the products that we are using every day. 
So is this the whole reason for it? Is this the cause? Is, does the lifestyle have nothing to do with it whatsoever? Do dietary choices have nothing to do with it? Is it all the processed shit and the sedentary lifestyles that guys are living nowadays? Playing video games all fucking day? Not that, you know, if that's your job, whatever. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying shit that's not necessarily conducive to optimizing your T levels essentially and downstream your DHT, which is going to then impact how big your dick is, you know, how much sperm production you have, etc. Your intratesticular testosterone levels, are they going to be majorly determined by how much plastics, pesticides, and products you're using? Or is it going to be determined by how many macro and micronutrients you're eating? If you're fucking exercising, how much muscle you have, your sleep quality, shit like that. Like what is going to move the needle more in your opinion? Like I would think this, sure, maybe this plays into it a bit, but I am surprised this video did not touch on this really at all. Plastics, pesticides, and chemicals in our products contain EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals. These chemicals can bind to hormone sites in our body and fool our bodies into thinking they're the natural hormone. Hormones are signaling molecules. So when he says this, he's thinking of like, here's an example. So androgen receptor agonists, like a lot of you guys probably understand if you watch this channel that anabolic steroids all have the same target. They're trying to get to androgen receptors, bind to them and cause gene transcription. So, however, they're all, you know, different compounds. So despite the fact that they're different compounds, they have the same target and they will compete with one another for binding. So the same thing he's talking about here with these EDCs, they would, you know, bind to, for example, estrogen receptors and cause um, agonism that would then provide negative feedback to the HPTA and lower testosterone levels when otherwise there may not have been that receptor bound and agonized to begin with, that's the kind of thing they're getting at. Because that's the only thing that makes fucking sense to begin with anyways, is having artificially induced negative feedback via these endocrine disrupting things. Does that actually happen in practical application though? You know, I would think the shit I mentioned before would have a bigger role in the equation in your body that are a part of your amazing endocrine system. The endocrine system consists of these glands in your body that secrete hormones in order for your organs and your tissues to essentially communicate. For example, when stressed, your brain will signal your pituitary gland to release ACTH. And this pituitary gland is in your brain. No, it is not your testicles, even though it looks like it. The ACTH enters the blood where it then makes its way to your adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland secretes cortisol, another hormone that enters the blood stream and then increases glucose within your body to help you deal with that stress. See, the thing that's weird that I don't get is how he just explained like a very complicated mechanism where your body secretes something, which then leads to a downstream effect of this, which then increases that, which then causes this. Like, why did you not just explain the actual impact, the things you're talking about have on the HPTA? Like, this is a totally irrelevant part of what this video is about right now. Like, I get it's an example, but that was like a very complicated example that could have just been an opportunity to explain how these things might agonize estrogen receptors and cause negative feedback. That would have been probably easier to explain even than this one deal with that stress. This is just one example of endocrine biological signaling processes, but there are many more that control how you breathe, how your digestion works, and even the sensory you feel when you touch a wall. Back to the endocrine disrupting chemicals. By the way, I could be entirely wrong on how potent these endocrine disrupting chemicals are. I'm just saying, in general, if I was going to guess what moves the needle most, again, be the shit over here or EDCs. They can also control how our natural hormones are broken down and stored. And they also change our body's sensitivity to the real hormones. So let's start with the endocrine disrupting chemicals, phthalates. These chemicals are in plastics because they make them soft and flexible. They're also in floor coverings and soap and hairspray. One study of 72 common household objects found phthalates in three quarters of the products, such as deodorant and hair gels and fragrances. So in rats, if the expected mother is exposed to see something I find interesting and I'm wondering you know like I believe that this shit can play a role for sure like something I've noticed is how prevalent autoimmune disease is in uh, autoimmune disease in females is far more prevalent than males it seems I think this is clinically proven as well like it's far more common in like females to have Hashimoto's thyroiditis a lot of random shit that guys can get, but it's a lot less common. Now, I wonder, does this have to do with the use of products? Like in general, females are going to be using a lot more products on their faces, a lot more products on their skin that is going to get absorbed 
and then systemically introduced and potentially have some sort of downstream impact on things like this. I don't really know. Is it, does it have to do with the androgen to estrogen ratios in the body? Like what does it have to do with? I actually think a while ago, I think, uh, I forgot who it was that told me that estrogen levels actually play a huge role in autoimmune susceptibility too. But to be honest, like it, it's an interesting thing to consider, you know, like it's not, could be just a coincidence. Females use way more products in general and they also have more prevalence of autoimmune issues. I don't really know though, just something I wanted to bring up. Phthalates, 18 to 21 days after mating, the male pups will have a decrease in testosterone. In humans, if an expectant mother is exposed to phthalates between week eight to 12 of the embryo's development, it can disrupt testosterone and lead to boys coming out with a decreased penis size, lower sperm counts, and a smaller ADG, a smaller taint. Now let's look at the BPA, which you may have heard a lot about. It can be found in nonstick coatings, in lots of different plastics, in electronics and also in receipt paper. Men working at factories with high levels of BPA had their urine examined. It turned out that increased levels of BPA in their urine led to four times lower sperm counts three times lower sperm vitality and decreased sperm mobility. Sons of men with high BPA exposure had decreased ADGs and were more likely to have ejaculation issues and decreased sexual desire. And there are a lot of other chemicals that disrupt endocrine hormones from those in plastic toys and air fresheners, nail polish, pesticides, to the grease and stain repellents in fast food containers, and the dioxins found in meat and dairy, all of which have an impact on sperm count, taint size or penis length. It's not just EDCs and plastics and pesticides that are decreasing male fertility, it's also other things that we are just doing to our body. Smoking cigarettes or even just exposure to secondhand smoke can actually cause damage to our sperm. It can decrease our testosterone and decrease our ability for the little guys to make its way to the egg. And right now, men smoke five times as much as women, which is causing a decrease in male fertility. And it's not just cigarettes, sadly, also those marijuana smokers like me also have to look out because a 2015 study in Denmark found that smoking marijuana more than once a week led to a 29% decrease in sperm count. Also curing meat with nitrites and nitrates and the chlorinated pollutants that can be found in animal meat and dairy can damage your sperm's DNA. Men who eat more processed meat have a decreased sperm count and decreased normally shaped semen. And this could be caused by the endocrine issues that these chemicals in these meats have. One thing is becoming extremely clear which is that the chemicals we are now using in our modern world are creating a decrease in male fertility. Yeah, so like, you know, where I'm at listening to this, I'm still thinking the food that people are buying, the processed shit they're eating, the people not exercising, the people sitting in a chair all day, the people who are not really giving their body either the building blocks in order to actually create hormones properly, not having the recovery in check, actually having high quality sleep, People are not actually putting their body in a state of need to even fully optimize these functions to begin with. And then we're blaming like entirely plastics and like random products and shit. Like I would just circle back and look at the meat and potatoes of shit. Like the diet itself is going to be the needle mover. The needle mover, in my opinion, yeah, he's mentioned the, uh, you know, processed food a little bit. He's talking about meat and milk, which is interesting. Meat and dairy he's talking about. I don't know if he's about to recommend I don't eat fucking red meat, which would be like I can understand saying don't eat shitty um, processed goods, but saying don't eat red meat. I don't know if he's about to say that, I hope not. Yeah, in general, I think this is majorly like a lifestyle shift over the years. People are eating less and less micronutrient dense foods and they're opting for zero value foods that are just calories and like artificial sugars and shit, thinking they're being healthy because then they're avoiding the sugar filled shit. And that's like the next step of like the people who are actually fat. So you have like people who are fat, who are eating sugar filled dense shit, who are super unhealthy, have all this negative feedback, have all these micronutrient deficiencies, etc. They're like, you know, the prime example of people who are dragging down the average. And then you have these people here who are, you know, trying to avoid the calorie dense, sugar dense shit, but then they end up eating just myriads of artificially sugar filled micronutrient deficient food. That's not really even food to begin with in order to, you know, not get as fat, but then they end up micronutrient deficient and they're not getting what they need to optimize their hormones either. And you have a very small proportion of the population who is actually eating a reasonable amount of food that's sufficient for their energy demands, but not overly abundant. 
and they're actually getting high quality nutrients in and they're having high quality foods and they're actually getting their sleep and blah, blah, blah. And these are the minority of individuals who will have optimized hormone production in my opinion. And yeah, maybe the plastics and shit might, you know, t hit those a little bit too. But at the end of the day, I think, again, this kind of stuff, everyone's like overlooking the obvious, dude. Like we're thinking, oh, that fucking, you know, plastic water bottle that they're trying to sell me. That's the reason, dude. All these, uh, you know, the cologne in the fucking mall, you know, the thing that I was walking by the other day, that, uh, that secondhand smoke I smelled when I was like going down the stairs the other day. That definitely fucked up my test. I'm definitely hypogonadal because of that. It has nothing to do with the fact that I ate Pop-Tarts for breakfast and play fucking Fortnite for 12 hours a day. So much so that a variety of studies have found a 1% decrease in testosterone in men per year since 1982. As for what you can do right now at home, you can eat less meat and dairy. You cannot- Bro, eat less meat. <laughs> Fuck off, dude. Heat up things in plastic containers because that can actually have the chemicals. Like, at least be specific about what meat to not eat. Don't just say, don't eat less meat. Eat less bioavailable B, B vitamins. Eat less of the most nutrient-dense food you can fucking get. Like, okay, bro, I'm gonna stop eating my liver because you fucking told me to. Seep into your food. You can eat less takeout and fast food as the actual packaging can be an issue in those cases, as well as the gloves that fast food workers while they're preparing your food. One study found that teenagers who ate out more had a 55% increase in some of these EDCs compared to teenagers who solely ate at home. If you do use a nonstick pan, keeping the heat low and for shorter periods of time, and if you ever see any sort of flaking on them, get rid of them. Phthalates can leach into food in processing practices and in food packaging. So eating less processed food or food with less packaging can also help. We need to regulate corporations so that they can't just use these chemicals on us. Right now, corporations can experiment with our bodies. The way that this regulation works, it's kind of innocent until proven guilty. So only when we start to realize the detrimental effects of these chemicals, do we then start to regulate them. We need to change that order. You may have seen this tweet from Greta Thunberg. I think it's rather they're smart and funny, and we will see you at the next climate march. We need to hit the streets and hold our governments and our corporations accountable when it comes to regulating these chemicals out of our bodies. They need to keep us safe. They need to help us lead healthier lives. And we didn't even really know the effects that these chemicals were gonna have on us. And now that we do, we need to figure out how to get them out. This is really important so that we can keep all of our and If you wanna learn more, grab the book Countdown by Shanna Swan. She's Okay, so, you know, I think at the end of the day, like, it's pretty, even guys who are coming off of hormones, for example, and they're trying to optimize their post-cycle therapy regimens, you know, they'll take the proper drugs, but oftentimes when it comes to having the proper macro and micronutrients present in order to actually support recovery, they're totally fucking missing the mark, and they end up with, you know, half-assed recovery and perhaps not even recovering fully at all. These are individuals that, again, are missing the big picture. Everyone just thinks it's, you know pharmacology related when in reality like people don't realize that nutrients and foods are like signaling molecules too essentially in your body and will lead to either you having peak performance and or you know like fucking shitty performance so i don't know like some of the broad you know spectrum claims in the video i generally agree with pretty much everything he says as far as avoid this kind of shit like it's probably not good however some of the stuff like just avoiding red meat like what the fuck that's a bit of a stretch, dude. Like, did he, he's, he just said red meat, right? Now at home, you can eat less meat and dairy. You can not eat less meat and dairy. Like just, just like that. Okay, bro. Uh, so obviously the answer is not throw all your fucking red meat away because you know, of course your beef liver, the most like nutritious thing you could possibly eat is definitely bad for you. Like, no, dude. <laughs> come on. Oh, it's just the plastics, bro. Like, fuck. So what would I do? Um, I think I've already sufficiently covered it, you know? Go plug your diet into chronometer.com and you can see for yourself exactly where you are deficient, at least by, you know, traditional RDAs and you can kind of extrapolate from that how you will. But in general, it's a good guideline for if your diet model is high quality. A lot of people are just spitballing, speculating if their diet is good or not. You know, they might think it is. They think, oh, I have a balanced diet. I eat this, that. I have my veggies. I have this. You know, literally just like take the fucking 20 minutes, plug your diet into chronometer, see how it breaks down. You know, and uh, you know, some of the foods aren't going to be, have the full uh, breakdown for chronometers, unfortunately, but you know, it's a good baseline that has a reasonable, reasonably accurate assessment. If you're actually micronutrient deficient or not, you can see all of the vitamins, all the minerals, you can see where you are falling short of the mark when it comes to your diet model in particular. And yeah, obviously at the same time, do you know, the shit he mentioned about the fucking phthalates and shit, 
Uh, like, yeah, man, maybe that plays a big role too. You know, I don't know for certain. I just know that most people don't actually know what a high quality diet is and they just eat random processed shit all day and have their version of a healthy diet is just because it, you know, is a reasonable calorie intake that therefore it's a high quality diet model when in reality they're deficient in like fucking 10 different things at the same time. Like, it's not hard. Just like stop using, uh... <laughs> my fitness pal and go switch to chronometer and see how you do and then see uh, where you fall short of the mark, if at all, and kind of backfill where appropriate if you're deficient in something. And um, some of the practices this guy's mentioning, you know, may be useful as well, minus the whole eliminating fucking meat just generally, that's kind of stupid. Um, but at the end of the day, what is going to impact your dick size? It's going to be your DHT level. So max out your T. Subsequently to that, you're going to have as maxed out of DHT as you can. You know, all you can really do, again, to maximize that hormone production is you know, stay at a reasonable body composition. If you're too fat, it doesn't matter how much fucking plastics and shit are in the, in the room. You were going to have negative feedback through the aromatase enzyme leading to increased amount of aromatization, which has negative feedback to your HPTA and lowers your testosterone levels significantly. That kind of thing is controllable. Lifestyle and diet. Having the proper cofactors to actually produce everything that you need to produce. Diet related, lifestyle related, sleep hygiene related, etc. So again, think about the meat and potatoes here. That's kind of my uh, stance on it. I'm kind of surprised that they didn't at least touch on like very obvious basic fundamentals of good diet practices. And they just said, you know, the, the food is processed, avoid it and stop eating meat and then don't have, you know, plastics and shit. Like don't cook it with this cookware. Like, okay, I won't, but <laughs> I should probably know how to eat properly too. If I actually want to optimize this, should I not? So Anyways, I don't know. Maybe I'm being a bit too critical on the shit, but it's like some of the like really obvious like hint, give me fucking like silver platter answers often go overlooked, I find, by like hyper analyzation things that are going way over the top. Like how much research went into this, uh, you know, the phthalates and fucking shit when it was like, you know, teach me how to eat, bro. That's like the main thing that we should be doing and looking at right now and how to sleep. How to exercise, like meat and potatoes, dude. Anyways, that is my stance. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplacemore8.com. Follow me on Instagram, and moreplacemore8, Facebook, Snapchat, Bitchu, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with. My TRT clinic, it's all telemedicine from the comfort of your own home. Check your lab work, you know, through my recommended lab tests and diagnostics to actually see where your testosterone levels are at, ideally, and see if you are on the right track with your um, other health biomarkers. Obviously, it's important to stay on top of those as well when it comes to actual uh, um, high quality life, um, producing the amount of hormones that would be adequate in order to not encounter this kind of a scenario where you have a poorly growing dick or a sub subpar growth of your dick and subpar sperm production. This kind of shit is going to be stuff you can identify through lab work, ideally, and you can use it as a proxy for your progress when you are trying to optimize rather than just you know, spitballing shit and brainstorming and thinking that, oh, if I just remove this and this and this, and therefore that equals being perfect. Like, no, like actually look at the physical representation of your efforts to improve yourself in your lab work and see if it is playing out. See how your lipids are. See how your hematology is. See how your kidney markers are. Like your organ stress will kind of tell you straight up what's going on in your life. Is there stuff going on that is suboptimal? Are you exposed to some level of stress? You will soon find out when you actually get proper diagnostics. So you can check that out as well as anything else I'm associated with in the video description below. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.